Hi and welcome to Frontline City Church's YouTube channel. We are a sterling based Assemblies of God church based right in the heart of Scotland with the goal of making disciples of Jesus who are spiritually robust, powerful and strong. We hope that you enjoyed today's message and if you would like to hear more from us, please feel free to check out our website which is linked in the description below. Enjoy. Alright, if you got your Bibles, turn to second the second chapter of Colossians. Uh, continue on in Colossians. And um, we will read the first fifteen verses. Colossians 2. I'm reading from the ESV. It says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all those who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and of the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom all I'm sorry, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and build up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes captive, takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to the human traditions, according to the elemental prince of spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of christ having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of god who raised him from the dead and you who were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of the debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set aside, set, he, he, this he has set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them in open shame by triumphing over them in him. Amen. Well, God bless your word to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The um, the New Testament, of course, wasn't written with chapters and verses. It didn't have, um, you know, advertisements put in the middle of it. It didn't have page <laughs> breaks and all those sorts of things. So to understand, sometimes you've got to go back to the previous chapter to understand what he's actually getting to here. Because in this one it says, for I want you to know, really goes back to chapter one, where he's talking about this incredible um, ministry of the church. The, the the church's ministry is manifold, as you know, and there's many things we could say. But in one sense, Paul sums up this whole ministry of the church, what the body of Christ is really all about, what leadership, what ministry, what apostolic, prophetic mm -hmm pastoral, evangelistic, teaching, all those ministries, eldership, what it's all really about. And he brings it in there when he when he picks it up in this area of, uh, we'll pick it up in 24. It says, For now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake in my flesh. I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for the ages and generations, but is now revealed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known the great, how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. To him we 
Him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. So he's saying there that the, the, the real reason for the church and the ministry and the body and the local church is to bring people to a place of maturity, mm -hmm. to a place, one translation says perfection, but it really means to be mature, that we can no longer stay um, in puberty. We can't stay in a pubescent state. We've got to mature from childhood through puberty into this place of maturity where we actually aren't being tossed to and fro like children any longer, but a place of maturity. And he's saying that that's the case there. And he says, I labor, I struggle, I warn, I teach, I, I present everybody into that situation. And the main thing he's preaching and teaching is the key of what we're going to talk about today is this principle that it's Christ. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the mystery that, that mm -hmm. baffled the Jews mm -hmm. and that baffles the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. But he says, listen, the answer is Christ. It's the answer to the Gentiles is Christ. The answer for the Jew is Christ. The answer for the Greek, it's Christ. The answer for everybody mm -hmm. is Christ. Yeah. And it's not just Christ, it's Christ in you. Mm -hmm. I hope of glory. Every other religion is looking to try and get their God to come and to visit them and to come into some sense of their presence. But Christianity says your God lives within you. Yeah. And actually he dwells within you. Yeah. And you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. You become the temple of God. The temple, the New Testament talks about. So as Paul begins to write to the churches in um, Colossae and also in Laodicea, He's saying to them, hey, guys, the energy that I have isn't from me. The energy is from God and that I am desiring to bring you into the revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what he's saying there. I am struggling. I'm striving. I'm using every bit of energy I have, not for my own sake, but to bring us into this understanding. Mm -hmm. And he fights against it with a passion. When I first was looking at the, for this, this passage, I felt a few weeks just before Christmas, that God just really spoke to me and said, this is really an understanding of where the 21st century is at, 21st century church is at. It's got to come back to these terms again. It's got to come back to these goals and these realities of preaching mm. Christ in you, the hope of glory, dealing with, and we're going to talk about some of these vain philosophies and, and mm. areas of works and efforts to try and get back to, to these things. And, and when you read Colossians, you see he deals with this, this other world which he hints at called principalities and powers and mm. thrones mm. and uh, rulers and dominions. And, and he calls it here in this translation, elementary spirits. And he, he talks about this thing as there's another world that is trying to influence the world in which we live and it also trying to influence the church to stop them or to not so much stop them, but to sidetrack us to pursue other mm. ventures, thinking that it's going to give us the answer when in actual fact our whole focus and energy should be on the who is this Christ who lives within me? Mm -hmm. How great is this Christ mm. who lives within me? Yeah. How powerful is this Christ? Who has, and if we came to the end and part of our reading here, who has triumphed over all of the principalities and powers and all the enemies and has led them triumph. Even sin has been defeated and destroyed. My iniquities, my failings, my shortcomings, my trespasses, everything that was written against me, which I have committed, was nailed to his cross. Mm -hmm. yeah. And no longer is that a problem in my life. Yeah. My past and my shortcomings and my failings mm. and my weaknesses are no longer my problem mm. that stops me from the revelation of Christ living within me. Mm -hmm. You see? Yeah. And when you look at this, he's addressing all of these issues right through to the very thing. Well, I just, I'm not worthy. Rubbish, says Paul. Don't you realise that he has nailed all those things to his cross? Mm. He has triumphed over it. 
Don't you realize that you were baptized into his death? You are dead? And now you are living with him? Don't give me this. I'm not worthy. Rubbish? Rubbish! You can just... That's, that's the modern Ron Edwards translation. But, but really what he's trying to say is, hey, guys, listen to me. He said, there is nothing that can stop you except you get a hold of, not get a hold of what I'm talking about. So here he is. He says, I'm striving, I'm longing, I'm struggling. Right? We, we use that term in the wrong way, but he's saying that every ounce of energy mm. I use I have for you so that those who are in Laodicea and those who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be knit together, mm -hmm. that they may be encouraged. I, I love this, this term of knitting together. It, it's, it's, I, I sort of was just thinking about it and I could see like, you see two pieces of cloth and how they've got holes in it like that and then you get the, the stitches that go through it, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you see them, they pull it and the stitches pull the thing together like that. That's what he's saying. He says, I am working by preaching the love of God, by preaching the revelation of Christ, by preaching the good news of Jesus Christ and who you are in him. He says, what I'm doing is I'm pulling together the things that have been separated. We are pulling together Jew and Gentile. We're pulling together those that are unclean and turning them into clean. We are pulling together all the things that have been trying to pull us apart. And he's saying, if you get this in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male mm. or female. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We are one in him. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And it's in this, this revelation of Jesus. It's like we're in this room here and, and we really don't relate to each other based on the facts that we know each other and we might like the same things or whatever. The reason we relate is because of a person called Jesus who we relate through. Mm. Yeah. And I relate to Ben through Jesus and he relates to me through Jesus. And it's in that we can have differences of opinion, we can have differences of character and whatever, but be deeply joined together mm -hmm. because of this incredible thread of the love of God in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing? Wow. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. And in that, we had this, this wonderful gospel that uh, Paul is preaching to them. He says there, the being knit together in love to reach the fullness of assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, which has been hidden mm. by all the ages, but is now revealed to us. Isn't that incredible? Mm. This is it. This is what it's all about. And And... As you go into this whole story, he begins by doing these wonderful things. He does this, if you read this chapter, he does this thing which I call boom, <clears throat> boom, and then caution. He sort of goes boom with this, you are in Christ. He is the everything. Boom. But be careful. Don't let anyone mm -hmm. take you away in vain philosophy. Boom. Christ is the fullness. Mm -hmm. The deity live within him. Boom. There's other people that are trying to destroy you. So you got this, you got this boom, boom, caution, boom, caution, boom, caution. And it's the revelation that sets us free from the temptation. See, mm -hmm. we think that if we can resist more and resist more and do more and do more, we can break temptation. But it's not. It's the revelation of mm -hmm. Christ mm -hmm. in us who breaks the temptation. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Mm -hmm. So God is good. So he's knit together by the knowledge of Christ. It's a mystery. Now, the, the mystery of Christ is Christ in us, the hope of glory. But there's also this mystery that, um, which, which, which the Jews couldn't get was the fact that Christ has joined Jew and Gentile together in the one new. Mm. It was a mystery. <clears throat> to them, they just couldn't comprehend it. You see, they lived in this concept of being the elect or the being the elite. And um, even today we have people that get muddled up by that. They call the, the Jewish nation the elect. But in fact, the concept of election or a concept of elect doesn't mean what we think it means. To be elect means that you have been given everything you need to find out the truth. So Israel as a nation was the elect nation because they were given the covenants, they were given the law. They were given the priesthood. They were given, 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 given the temple. They were given so many things. 
But if they never bothered with it, mm. it didn't do anything for them. Mm. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's like I could give you all the information about something and everything you could put in your library and say, look, I've got all this stuff on it. And you say, but what does it mean? I don't know. I've never read it. Okay. I've never studied it. Mm. I've never applied it. Mm. But I've got all the information. That's what it's saying. Mm. It's saying that they were a nation that were given everything. Mm -hmm. That's why they were held accountable. That's why judgment came so fiercely to them because they did not, as a nation, rise up and take it. In fact, it says he came to his own and his own received him not. Mm -hmm. But to any who believed in him, they become now. And this is the great mystery that it's not a matter of being elect. It's a matter of receiving the Christ. Mm -hmm. And then you become mm -hmm. saved and elected within him. That was a mystery that they that, that uh, has to be comprehended, you know. There's the mystery of the new covenant, the, which is the new one, the, the mystery of Christ in us, that the, all the mysteries, all the treasures of truth, all the mystery of salvation, the mystery of the, of the, of the, of the life after death is all in Christ himself and that we now are complete in him. Each one of us now has this incredible um, access. You see, the, the background, of course, what he's dealing with here was the concept of Gnosticism, this secret knowledge, that there was this concept that there was a group of people and the answer to life was to get more knowledge. The more knowledge you got, the closer you were to salvation and holiness and and the God and so on like that. And they got to the place where you then became the special elect or the special ones, the ones with special knowledge. And Paul is defeating that, saying, no, 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 no. That's not it at all. All knowledge and wisdom is in Christ. Have Christ and you have it all. And there's no special one, no greater one, no lesser one. We are all one in him and in him we have it all. And so he's fighting against that. He's fighting against the, the, the three major forms of it. One was that you had to have Jesus and Judaism. You had to have Jesus and Moses, Jesus and the Old Testament, Jesus and the Old Covenant. But in actual fact, it's not, it's just Jesus. Mm -hmm. But also there was fighting against the Gnostics. And I said this last week, I think the Gnostics had this two pronged philosophy. One was that because the world and the spirit is two different things, so we've got to completely abandon ourselves from everything that's worldly. So they would eat, one group would eat only very simple foods. They wouldn't marry. They wouldn't take any pleasure. They wouldn't wash. They wouldn't comb their hair. They would, they would just live this basic existence, if that. And, um, and they thought that was the way that they could get closer to God. Then there was the other ones on the other side of the fence, same philosophy, but a different side of the fence, that believed because the spirit and the world were separate, it didn't matter what you did in the physical, it doesn't affect you because you're a spiritual being. So they went off into every type of debauchery and every type of indulgence of the flesh, thinking that it doesn't really matter because that all dies away and that we're spirit beings. And so Paul's addressing all that, saying, no, 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 all that stuff is rubbish. <laughs> the answer is having a relationship with this Christ, get the mystery which has been revealed in Christ and all those things are answered. So that's the basis of which he's coming to. That's what he's trying to get across to them in that sense. And he begins to, as I said, he does the boom, you know, it's in Christ. And then he says, but watch out, people are going to try to come in with, with different philosophies and these things. The word that's used there is beguile. Be careful of those who are going to beguile you with secret mysteries, magic keys, mm -hmm. you know? And I've got to be totally honest. I've been to Christian bookshops and I reckon there's a whole bunch of magic keys. Mm -hmm. They're called um, how-to books and um, the five steps of the six ways of the seven steps to the fine, <laughs> whatever. And it's always got this magical how to be successful, how to be a Christian millionaire, how to be, you know, I think Paul would say, rubbish! <laughs> He would say, no, there is no magic keys. It's, it's, it's not Jesus and, it's just Jesus. It's this, the Christ. 
the revelation of Christ, that is the freedom and the depth of relationship. And I, the more I look into this, the more I realise that Paul was not trying to preach doctrine to them. And Paul was a great one for doctrine. And I, I love teaching. I think teaching is important. We find that he does allude to the fact that we should keep to the traditions that have been taught to us by our forefathers and so on. But, but he's not saying that's the key. He's saying the key is they are teaching you who it is that's within you. And then it's who he is within you is where you get your true strength and joy and revelation. And, 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 and he says there, by every energy that works within me, he energizes us. It's not by our own strength, okay? Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a simple yet complexity that's there. It's, it's, this, it's this life flow that takes place. That he's, that, he's, that he's looking at here. Let's have a look at verse 5. He says, For though I am absent in you in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see the good order and the firmness that you have in Christ. That's a, they're military terms of rank and file, eh? a, a church that's in order. It's speaking about soldiers who are set in array for battle. Soldiers that don't break rank, they know their rank, they know where their position is, they know how they wear the function. In other words, they know the will of God for their life. That's what he's saying there. And that they are, where is it? And they're firm in Christ. They're established. They're not, this is this maturity thing that he's talking about, to being mature in Christ. Okay. But he says, though I'm absent in body, yet I'm with you in spirit. Now, more modern translations tend to put there that uh, although I'm not there, I'm with you. In, in, am I, I'm, yeah, I'm cheering you on or whatever. But I think that Paul's getting a little bit further than that. He's saying there is this apostolic connection that I have with you. Now, this subject's a big subject and I won't even be able to do it justice. But there definitely seems to be this, this realm in which God has put in the body ministries that are there for the benefit of the body of Christ. Paul being an apostle there, he says, listen, although I'm not there with you and some of you never even seen my face, but I do have authority to tell you some things. I'm going to tell you, boom, Christ is in you, but I'm also going to say, there's people that are creeping in to try and teach you the wrong things. So be careful and be cautious. Listen to what I'm saying. And he's saying that the apostolic spirit, the apostolic authority I call it the apostolic vine life. The life of the spirit is in you, um, in your church. Now, let's have a look at, he uses this again in, in another place. He uses it again in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 4. Let's have a look at that. 1 Corinthians 5, 4. You see, he uses this same term again. 1 Corinthians 5, 4. And he says, when you are assembled in the name of Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are delivered the man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Without getting into all the details of what that was about, Paul is saying, when you assemble together, my spirit is there with you. I don't think it was his ghost. That's not what I'm saying. But the authority of the apostolic authority was now invested in those elders by him writing to them and saying, when you do that, you are doing it with an apostolic authority that my spirit is there with you. Mm. Right? And the power of the Lord Jesus is there. So there is something to do with being open and listening to those who have authority in the church, who know what they're talking about, who speak to us and speak into the life of our churches. If you go across to um, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, <coughs> and uh, picking up in verse 28, he says there again, he, he begins to, he uses different terminology here. In, in Ephesians, he talks about God has appointed some to be apostles, and uh, the prophets and evan teachers and evangelists and so on. But here he puts it in an order. He says, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, 
second prophets, third teachers, then the miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administrations, various kinds of tongues, etc., etc. So here he's sort of saying that the one of the major feeders, leaders, teachers, and instructors, fathers in the faith is apostolic ministry. Okay? So here when he's speaking to them as the apostle to the Colossian church, to the Laodiceans, he's saying, listen closely to what I've got to say because what I've got to say is determines your outcome, determines what you do and how you begin to. If you follow what I'm saying, you will be grow, grow bold and be a part of it. And so the conclusion of that section is, guys, listen, Christ in you, the hope of glory is the answer. The mystery of the Jew and the Gentile becoming one in Christ. The mystery that one and in Adam all died and in Christ all shall be made alive. Okay? So all this has come through the incredible work of the cross. Now, he then sort of takes on a different vein, same sort of philosophy, but a different vein now. And he begins to um, pick up on this whole thing with verse 6. Uh, he uses this word, therefore, which again is that link word. The therefore means that because of what of all that I've just said, because of all that you've just understood about Christ in you, the hope of glory, because of the, the fact that I'm connected with you in spirit, because there is this authority that I have, because of the work that I've been doing, trying to uh, allow you guys to be knit together. He says, therefore, as you have received Jesus Christ the Lord, or Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, how did we receive Christ? Well, we received him by faith, and so our walk is by faith. Okay? Our walk is by faith. We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. You understand? Mm -hmm. As you have received Christ, so walk in him. Also, another way of looking at that is as you have received Christ. Well, the reason I received Christ is because light came. I was in darkness, and light came. Bang! All of a sudden, I remember nearly 50 years ago, sitting in this place where, where where, I was in darkness and all of a sudden this guy preached the gospel and light came and I went, bang, I don't even know what it is. I don't understand it. I don't comprehend very much of it, but I can see it. It's Jesus. And I asked Christ into my life. And the Bible says that um, as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses me from all sin. So how do I walk? How do I receive Christ? I saw him. By faith, I accepted him. And so I continue to walk in the light by faith. Okay? It's not by doing this and doing that. He's saying it's by revelation of this Christ who lives within us. As you've received him, don't go back to the beggarly elements. Don't go back to philosophies but go on in this depth of revelation and relationship as you receive Christ walking in. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just that faith as you've been taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So he's saying the what you've been taught by me, what you've been taught through the, through the other apostles, what you've been taught through your teachers and those that are anointed of God, keep hold of that. Be rooted, be built up in Christ. And in faith. So anybody that's teaching you not to build yourself in Christ, anyone who's not teaching you to root yourself in Christ, anyone that's teaching you not to be thankful for Christ, be careful of. Okay? Then he goes on in verse 8. See to it that no one take you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Okay, just a side note here. The side note is that I don't think Paul is against philosophy per se. Philosophy really is the ordered wisdom. In other words, it's the study of wisdom that has been put together to understand how things work and how things operate, how, 
how we can have a philosophical idea of certain things. But what he's this saying there is that philosophy alone will not give you the revelation of God. Mm. There's nothing wrong with philosophy within its context. But the greatest philosophers still don't know God. Mm. You understand what I'm yes. saying? Uh -huh. And they may have great philosophy. I, I got a guy that I I listen to every now and then and I think he's wonderful. He's but he doesn't know God. But he he knows a lot about wisdom and everyday life and he's you know, common sense, all that stuff. He's excellent. He has some great stuff, but he still doesn't know the Lord, mm -hmm. right? doesn't mean his philosophy is wrong. It just means that it's shallow in comparison to whatever. And he's saying, you're not going to find God by chasing philosophy. Mm. Nothing wrong with philosophy, but don't chase it to try and find God. You won't find God via philosophy. Mm. And that's interesting because the early church, it's very interesting. The early church, when you look at church history, some of the early church leaders believed that you couldn't come to Christ unless you came through Socrates or um, who's the other guy, um, Plato. They, they, were, they were your way to come to God. You had to go through their teaching and then you came to Christ, which this is what Paul's probably thundering against here is that, hey, hey, you don't have to come through some guru. You have to come through some philosophy. You just come to Christ. Oh. And he says, don't let anyone beguile you. Don't let anyone take you down this journey. Don't let them take you captive. That's what my translation says here. Make sure that no one takes you captive. Or one, the actual Greek word means don't let the devil come and take you as booty. <laughs> Talk about a booty call. But look, he told you, don't let anyone come and take you. Don't let the enemy come and say, oh, I captured you. You know, they're, they're a Christian, but they're absolutely going there and going. They're going, see, the devil doesn't want to stop you. He just wants to side, put you into the marshes, into the side, right? So he says, on through here, philosophy and vain and empty deceit, according to the human traditions. Now, if you looked at all the different categories of people he's dealing with, he's dealing with people with lots of tradition thinking that the tradition in itself is going to bring them to God. Now, there's nothing wrong with tradition. We all have traditions of certain things, but you're not going to find God through tradition. Yeah. Your tradition is not going to make you more and more and more and more um, godly or godlike. And that's not, that's not it at all. There's nothing wrong with tradition per se, but if you're going to use it as a tool, it's, and that's what the enemy wants you to do. You know, and you can go to church after church. You can go to, I went to a Catholic funeral just the other day and uh, and it was very traditional. It was a lot of what they said, if you understood what they were saying, was scriptural. But it was all done as a ritual formula and the, the incense over the, over the, the coffin and uh, different things and the crossing of themselves and all that. But, you know, I understood what it all symbolised, but it really it was just tradition. Mm. It was just a human tradition. It had no value. It had no depth. It had no spiritual value to the people who were watching or to the, the person who had died. Right? Nothing wrong with it in one sense, but it really had no spiritual element to it. Then he goes on to say, according to the element, elemental spirits of the world. Now, you can look this up in various different translations and various different um, um, dictionaries and so on like that. But what I think he's really trying to say is that all the elemental spiritual powers, all the demonic forces, all the elements of the world. And, and, and it's very interesting. I did some looking into listening to some ex-witches and warlocks and stuff like that, just wondering what on earth it was all about, you know. I wasn't really interested in it to become one. I just was a believer and wondering why they do it. And, you know, one of the things they came up with was that it's like these demonic forces have, 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 have written books or given instruction or something to do certain ritualistic formulas. And if you do these ritualistic formulas, these demonic spirits will obey you. Right? It's like, like a game in that sense. And when he's saying here that the elementary principles or the elementary spirits that are out there, 
that are sort of making us do these silly little things and all that stuff. And we can bring it into, into religious life too. Little things we have to do and all that stuff. And we bow and we do all these things. He's saying it's, it's just rituals. It doesn't work. Right? But I believe he's talking about all of the demonic stuff that goes on. All the things that go on and people don't even know what they're doing. And people that try to get these spirits to do what they want. You know, as he says there, he is above all thrones and all authorities and all kingdoms and all powers and all rulers. He said, why do you want to go to this elementary level that are playing games? Go to the top mm. and have a relationship with him. And he's saying that. Now, here's the interesting thing that sums this up. He brings it all down to that place of, of um, receiving it all and... Um, and so on but he wants to bring us into this final conclusion which is what we're going to try and tackle now bring us into this final conclusion elementary but not according to christ you see all that stuff is outside of christ then he says boom who is the fullness of the deity dwelling bodily you want to understand who god is Find out who Jesus is. Mm. Want to find out what God's like? Find out who Jesus is. He was the deity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was the fullness of the deity on earth. And you have now been filled in him. Wow. You are filled in him. Let me give you a little Bible study. Get a concordance and look up the words in him, through him, by him, um, in whom, and especially in the New Testament, and you will be amazed at the incredible revelation of who he is in us mm. and who we are in him. Okay? That's, that's, that's one of the greatest studies you can do. It takes a while to do it and wade your way through it, but boy, it's a good study. And you get the, you, you just your element of faith just rises as you begin to realize who he is in me and who I am in him. It's incredible. <coughs> you have been filled in him okay so in jesus you are now filled and he is the head of all rule and authority and you have been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands no ritual no no ceremony nothing no you know cutting of the the, the flesh is a symbol putting off the body which is the flesh by the circumcision of christ having been buried with him in baptism and through him being raised with the powerful working of the dead who raised him from the dead. I see it like this, and we'll sort of finish off on this. We have, if you were to see um, history as a timeline or a, uh, I suppose a timeline is probably the way to do it, and where the camera is to say the cross, okay? You have the history of the world. You've got... All the different philosophies, all the different styles. You've got the Mosaic law, you've got the priesthood, you've got the sacrifices, you've got all these elements which had truth. And as the Bible says, they were shadows, they were elements of truth. But also you have all the elements that were false. All of the witchcraft and all the worship of evil spirits and all the different things and all that stuff that you think right then, right through even to my own sins my own shortcomings, all those things. And if you look at it, it all channels down into the cross. And there into the cross, it is finished. It is obliviated. All my sins are washed away. I was buried with him in baptism. All my sins were nailed to his cross. All my shortcomings, all the demands of the law, everything was nailed to the cross into this focal point of the cross. <laughs> Boom! all dealt with no longer can those things have any hold <coughs> no longer do they have any power over me in the past no longer can they control me if i understand what the cross is and there in the cross he then rises from the dead and as he does we come out the other side of the camera in that sense and out into this new world where the cross now affects everything my future it affects the world it affects Whatever. And if we were to study world history and see the effects and the change of the cross, how it has 
but Christianity has gone into every nation, all the nations, and it's changed and changed and changed and changed, and it's continuing to change this gospel. So that no longer is the sins of the past got any hold on me, no longer does a vain philosophy have any hold, because we have found him. See, the cross isn't a point in history. The cross is a history-making event. Mm -hmm. It changed history. Yeah. Not just world history, but eternal history. Mm -hmm. It changed a, a whole lot. And then when you look at all the different images that are around the cross of the sense that there was darkness for, was it, three hours, and there was this and there was and the voice of God speaking and the and the Father and then Jesus died and laid down his life and then there's the resurrection and the and the bodies coming out of the grave and then Jesus rising from the dead and then the ascension. If you look at that whole period there, it changed history. Yeah. And what Paul is saying is guys, all these vain philosophies, all the elements the elemental spirits, all the principalities and powers and their <coughs> domains, all the different philosophies and ideas and and, and 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 vain ideas that are there, they're all being taken to the cross. Leave them there. Rise in the newness of life and walk in that. And then he says, just to finish this off, he says there, um, having been buried with him in baptism, you also were raised him through Christ for the power of God who raised him from the dead and you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's what it was, this side of the cross, God has made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses, cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands and set aside, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed all principalities and powers and rulers and made an open show of them, triumphing, over them in the cross. And so the boom is Jesus has done all that. The caution is, why would you come back this side of the cross and start playing around with elementary mm. principles? All the doctrines of the devils, even the you know, to pick up the mosaic law and everything again because it's all finished and completed. Shadow of things to come, mm. but the substance is Christ. We hope that you enjoyed today's message. If you did, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up, maybe share it with a friend. And if you want to know more about our church, then please feel free to check out our Instagram or our website in the description below. We hope you have a blessed week. God bless.